I'm Pastor Dennis, and we have a kind of long list of announcements this morning, so I'm going to get started with our announcements, our announcement time. Uh, just a reminder that uh, prayers this week, we're praying for those folks on page 35 in the church directory, and we're also praying for the Anvil Church of the Brethren, and the Mechanics Grove Church of the Brethren is praying for us, and don't forget also those on the prayer list in your bulletin. This week, uh, Bible study, Monday evening at 7 o'clock, and it's in the bulletin but Friday you can pick up your potato filling if you ordered some between 9 in the morning and 1 o'clock. Next Sunday, Easter Sunday, sunrise service at 7, breakfast at 7.30, Sunday school at 9, and of course worship at 10. Um, been asked to announce that teachers are needed for the children's and adult Sunday school classes. See a member of the Christian Ed uh, Committee if you are interested in, in helping with that. Uh, Christine Blackwell, Walter and Cindy Sattison, and Brenda Lentz are the persons on that commission. Uh, Dave Dubel asked me to share this with you this morning. Two weeks ago, we gave a brief overview of an upgrade initiative to our audiovisual system that was presented and approved at the March Council. Since then, we have received the following message from the Atlantic Northeast District Seeds of Faith Committee. And quoting, I'm happy to inform you that the Seeds of Faith Committee unanimously agreed to partner with Myerstown in your revitalization efforts by granting $5,000 towards the upgrade of your current AV live streaming ministry. So we're very thankful and blessed to have received this grant, which will assist us in expanding our outreach uh, ministry to our church family and our community. A similar grant, uh, we're applying for a similar grant through the denomination, and we're looking at other sources to play a role in providing the necessary funds, including groups within the church and contributions from individuals. You see in your bulletin that there were some contributions towards that fund last Sunday as well. Some of you might recall uh, Right Now Media as an uh, online video source that was available prior to COVID. Uh, we stopped that uh, subscription. We've renewed that subscription, and uh, it's available to you. Uh, this, this week, this Holy Week, instead of me putting out a, um, a midweek message, we're going to offer to you through Right Now Media a five-day Easter online study. And uh, we're going to just run a short video that uh, tells you a little bit about that, and then I'll tell you how you can participate in that. The resurrection is the most important event in all of history. Because Jesus died for our sins and because he rose from the grave, everything changes. It means that Jesus is who he said he is and that he did. He accomplished what he said he accomplished. The Son of God, the creator of the stars and the galaxies, and, and you and me, put his feet on earth. He entered into our pain and, and into our shame and into our sin, and he took those things upon himself, and he died in our place. In these sessions, we're going to walk a holy road, looking at the events leading up to Jesus' crucifixion. When we see Jesus in these stories, we are seeing a Savior who saves us by taking our place under the judgment that we brought upon ourselves through our sin. We should see ourselves in these stories. In fact, I'm going to show you that Matthew, the gospel writer, writes them in a way that helps us place ourselves in relation to the crucifixion. Finally, in these stories, we're not only going to see Jesus take our place, we're also also going to see him defeat death and sin on our behalf, putting an end to it for us forever. Jesus not only died for us, he was resurrected for us and now offers to live in us and through us and lead us to a life of victory and purpose in his strength. That is the invitation of these stories, is to find yourself in these stories and to realize that the Jesus who is dying in these stories is also dying for you. Free accounts are available to everybody in the church. Um, if you receive the church service emails, you'll receive an email with instructions on how you can enroll in that study or see Dave or Janet Dubel for some more information on that. The first study will begin actually tomorrow. So um, if you want to participate in that, you might want to get enrolled and uh, be participant tomorrow morning, tomorrow in that study. 
Palm Sunday, the day Jesus went into Jerusalem, the shouts of the crowds, Hosanna, Hosanna. Let's come into worship as Barb leads us. Good morning, everyone. Fantastic, Barb. What a way to open it up this morning on Palm Sunday. Uh, I'd like to say a gorgeous day out there, but we got a little bit of rain this morning. But that's going to help all those pretty flowers grow here pretty soon. I seen a good bit of daffodils yesterday uh, out on Iona Road that were already bloomed and sprouted. It was absolutely gorgeous. So the, this morning we're going to start out with some scripture, and I'll read Luke chapter 19, verses 29 to 40. 
When Jesus had come near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples, saying, Go into the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find there tied a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, Why are you untying it? Just say this, The Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told told them, as they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They said, The Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept throwing their cloak, their, spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice for all the deeds of power that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. And now if everyone that's able to could please rise for the opening hymn. And that will be all glory, laud, and honor.
Thank you, Father, for the life you have given us to live, for the sun rising to start another day, and the reminders of your creation surrounding us. When we witness a beautiful mark of your creative hand, let us recall that Christ was with you too when the world began and the sound of your voice. He eventually came to earth and watched the same sunrise we now see. He looked into the stars in the sky and now looks down upon us prayerfully with love. With grateful hearts, we praise you, God, for you, for who you are and who we are in you. Let the peace of Christ Palm Sunday entrance remain in our memories. When we are fearful and anxious, help us to recall the peace in which Jesus rode into the city so soon after to be crucified. God, our Father, help us to act in grace and peace in the face of fear, both known and unknown, knowing you are incredibly close. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And now for some music ministry from the dynamic new duo of Barb and Barb.
Thank you, Barb and Barb. And it looks like we have a lot of children here today, so if the children could come up for the children's message from Pastor Dennis, please. Clark, is that right? And Ella, right? I got it. Okay, very good. Um, I was wondering, do any of you have favorite sports teams? Maybe the boys especially. Who's yours? Blackhawks. Blackhawks. Uh, any Elko teams, okay? Same. Elko. Oh, okay, Elko. Baseball. Baseball teams. Any special team, Isaac? Phillies or somebody like that? Nobody in particular. Okay. What about him? Red Wings. Okay, some hockey folks here. One of my favorite teams. See if you can figure out who this is. <laughs> you got it already there. Okay. Who is it? The Eagles. The Eagles. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me tell you something about the Eagles. A couple of years ago, they did something totally unexpected. They won. There, fell off again. Okay. They won the Super Bowl. And they won it with a backup quarterback. They beat Tom Brady and the New England Patriots. Nobody expected that to happen. So all these people had, oh, right, the Eagles are great. They cheered them on, you know, loud cheers. Ever since that game, it's been downhill from there. And instead of cheering, the people are jeering. Does anybody know what jeering means? supporting them like they used to. Well, you know what? Something like that happened to Jesus. One day he rode into Jerusalem and the people were waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then that was a Sunday. By Friday, some of those people, same people, were jeering they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. And they just completely changed in their attitude towards him. And some of it was maybe some things he said during the week and maybe the way some of the other people were talking about him. But they, their, their attitude towards him just changed completely. Today is Palm Sunday, the day that we remember that day that he rode into Jerusalem with the palm, the people took palm branches. They had a lot of palm trees in, around Jerusalem. So they took branches from the palm trees and they waved them and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They were all excited about him being there. And for us this morning, even though we know that as the week went on, Jesus went to the cross and he died on the cross for us. We know that next Sunday we're going to celebrate Easter, that Jesus rose from the dead. So we have lots of reasons to cheer this morning. And let's not become some of that jeering crowd this week, okay? Let's cheer Jesus on. I'm going to give each of you two palm branches, okay? I think I have enough for two. One, two, three, four, five. I figured it. Okay. I'm going to give each of you two palm branches. And um, I promised Christine that you wouldn't be hitting each other with them in children's church or things like that. So what I'm going to suggest you do this morning, okay, I'm giving you two. You'll take you right. Okay. Owen didn't come up, did he? Oh, there he is. Yep. There's a one. Yeah. Well, give him, yeah, you hold one for him, okay? What I'd like you to do is keep one for yourself, and as you go to Children's Church, give one to somebody else out here in the congregation. Can you do that? Keep one for yourself and give one to somebody else in the congregation. Let's say a prayer. God, it's so good to come together on this Palm Sunday morning to sing our praises like the crowd did in Jerusalem on that day. Might we cheer Jesus this day and help us to be part of that cheering crowd even this week because we love him and we know that he loves us. Be with these children, I pray, in his name. Amen. Thanks. Go for Children's Church, okay? I didn't see too many of them give out palm branches yet. <laughs> <laughs> So we, we have some scripture reading now. We're going to start off with uh, John chapter 13, verses 1 to 5. 
now before the festival of the Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, son of Simon, Iscariot, to betray him. And during supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, and tied a towel around himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was tied around him. And now for John chapter 15, verses 12 to 17. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call your servants any longer, because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. John chapter 19, verses 14 to 18 and 28 to 30. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover. And it was about noon, he said to the Jews, Here is your king. They cried out, Away with him. Away with him. Crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which is Hebrew. In Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said, In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, it is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. And now for the first part of the message from Pastor Dennis. And in Sunday school, in Sunday school, somebody said, he's preaching two sermons this morning. And I said, no, it's just two parts of one sermon. <laughs> yes. Well, have you noticed how in our 21st century Western culture, the significance of so-called sacred days is quickly being forgotten? I mean, think about it. Culturally, Christmas has become more about the commercialism than the birth of a savior. Easter's become more about spring, brightly colored eggs, and candy than the resurrection of Jesus Christ. When I first started teaching back in the 1970s, Wednesday evenings were a sacred time, an evening reserved for church activities, and we weren't allowed to schedule school events on Wednesday evenings. Today, even Sunday morning has lost a lot of its sacredness as sports events are taking over the time that used to be reserved for worship. Well, with Christians worldwide, we're entering into a week known as Holy Week, beginning today with Palm Sunday. And one of those sacred days, the day we recall Jesus' entry into Jerusalem to the acclamation of the crowds and their shouts of Hosanna, blessed is he one, is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. There are other sacred days this week including Maundy Thursday. Maundy means command, and it refers to Jesus' command to do to one another as he had done to his disciples in washing their feet and then in sharing the bread and the cup of communion. Usually we would be gathering for love feasts this evening, our brethren twice a year recalling of the Last Supper Jesus celebrated with his disciples. And this coming Friday is Good Friday, a day when we remember the, the day that Jesus was crucified. Sometimes people wonder why we call it Good Friday. It seems to be a misnomer. But in the Old English, the word good was used in the sense of meaning holy, holy Friday. 
And in some Christian traditions, Saturday is called Holy Saturday. It's named in church tradition as a day remembering Jesus' time in the tomb. And it recalls some verses in 1 Peter which speak of Jesus descending into hell and preaching to the spirits in prison. And of course, next Sunday, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, the day that so much changed human history that 2,000 years later, it's still the single most important day for Christians around the world. For us low church brethren, these sacred days have not historically held as much significance in our practice as they have in some of, for some of our high church brothers and sisters. Our emphasis has always been on living out the teaching of Jesus in our everyday lives more so than in recognizing special days. I think it's fortunate that more and more we are recognizing the significance as a means to help us keep our focus on Jesus. Yet many people approach this Holy Week with some apathy. It's just a week like any other. Yet this is the most important week in our Lord's earthly life. No other week in human history has had more significance and more impact than the events that we recall during this Holy Week. I know we're not able to gather together this evening for Love Feast because of the pandemic, so I, I included in our service this morning three scriptures that are at least familiar to me as Love Feast scriptures. If you're not familiar with the Brethren Love Feast, it's really a three-part service recalling the events of what we know as the Last Supper, which was actually Jesus' last celebration of the Jewish Passover with his disciples. And in that final Passover, Jesus gave that service new meaning. In Love Feast, we read scriptures like the one from John 13, the account of Jesus washing his disciples' feet, and, and then we wash one another's feet, and some churches even do some washing of hands if kneeling is too difficult for some people. The second scripture might vary, but the one from John 15 where Jesus commands us to love one another is often the one that's chosen. We demonstrate that love as we share a common meal around the love feast tables, just as Jesus shared supper with his disciples. And the third scripture is often, it is often from John 19, which recounts Jesus' death on the cross. And following that reading, we break the bread and we drink the cup of communion, as Jesus instructed us to do in remembrance of him. And later this morning, we will share the bread and the cup. I truly believe that you cannot appreciate the glory of Christ's resurrection without recalling his experience of Holy Week. And to help you do that, this week I urge you to, to read chapters 12 through 21 in John's Gospel, the events of Holy Week in John's Gospel. Holy Week is a, is a week that is so significant that the world changed forever. And in Colossians 2, 8 through 15, Paul speaks of some of what Jesus' death and resurrection meant for him and what it means for the world. And we have a scripture reading from Colossians uh, 1, 15 to 23. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers, all things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. And now for Pastor Dennis's second sermon.
the events of Good Friday climax with Jesus' cry from the cross, it is finished. But what was finished? 1 John 3.8 says, The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. And that is what was finished on Christ's cross and in his resurrection. Jesus destroyed the works of the devil. C.S. Lewis, in his book, The Screwtape Letters, writes this. He says, There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both errors. And I think in our culture today, we really do see both errors. There persists a notion today that that intelligent people shouldn't believe in such things as evil spirits, devils, so to speak. Surprisingly, a lot of that comes from some theologians. An excessive and unhealthy interest in unholy spirits is evidenced in the preponderance of books, TV shows, movies, and games about vampires, demons, and the supernatural. In Ephesians 6, 11 through 12, Paul tells us to put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Well, what are these schemes, these these works of the devil, Satan, the Satan, the deceiver, the tempter, the accuser, whatever you want to call that ruler, the powers of this dark world and these spiritual forces of evil? I'm going to call him Satan this morning. Satan has one main purpose, separation, to separate us from God and to separate us from one another and to direct our devotion to those spiritual forces of evil instead of to God. That's what happened in Eden. Through shrewd questions, the devil in the form of a serpent twisted God's words and placed doubt in Eve's mind. Did God really say that you must not eat from the, the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? And it became the tempter's words against God's. God said, eat of that tree and you will die. Satan said, you won't die. Then the great deception, you'll be like God. Humanity disobeyed the creator. Sin entered into the human experience, and humanity was banished from the garden. Satan claimed his first human victims, and they and the entire human race were separated from God. Satan tried the same thing with, with Jesus when he tempted him in the wilderness. I'll give it all to you if you'll kneel down and worship me. But Jesus resisted. Away from me, Satan. And Jesus used similar words when Peter began to rebuke him for speaking of his his impending suffering and death. Get behind me, Satan, he said to Peter. To separate the Son from the Father, that would have been Satan's biggest triumph. In his first book in the Lord of the Rings trilogy, J.R.R. Tolkien describes the camaraderie of a diverse group known as the Fellowship of the Ring. Their quest is to destroy the power of the Dark Lord, which is lodged in this ring. They're a diverse group in every way, racially, physically, temperamentally, but they are united in their opposition to this Dark Lord. And in a section of the book, which didn't appear in the movie versions of that book, a conflict breaks out within the group. And weapons are drawn and harsh words are spoken, and this fellowship is nearly destroyed. When peace again prevails, a wise counselor in the group observes, saying this, Indeed, in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him. Nowhere is Satan's effort to separate us from God and from one another more evident than when there is discord among believers. 
Congregations split, denominations split. Our disunity is displayed openly in public debates on, on issues of morality and theology and even personality. Satan is having his way. When the church is divided, the power of evil is strong. The evil one's not called a deceiver for no reason. And one of his most deceptive schemes, as C.S. Lewis said, is to convince us that he doesn't exist. If you want to find out how real these principalities and powers are, try preparing a sermon about their reality, and you quickly find out how real they are. Another of Satan's weapons is the power of illusion. He seeks to delude us into believing that human knowledge and a human achievement can save us and that God is powerless and not worthy of our worship. There's a story told about the, the devil having a yard sale and all his tools are marked out with different prices. They were such things as hatred, jealousy, deceit, pride, all at very high prices. But over to the side of the yard was displayed a tool that seemed to be extremely worn, but it was also the most expensive. And the tool was labeled discouragement. When questioned, the devil said, it's more useful to me than any other tool. When I can't bring down my victims with any of the rest of these tools, I can use discouragement because so few people realize that it belongs to me. Discouragement is one of the deceiver's most powerful weapons. And as we observe the human condition, this pandemic, genocide, pointless murder of innocents like we keep seeing in the last week or so, we see per the pervasiveness of evil in the world and we, we can get so discouraged. We start asking those, well, if God really existed, kinds of questions. It's easy to lose hope in this messed up world. And since the world and sometimes our own lives are full of pain and stress and grief and worry, we begin to wonder how it can be said that Jesus won a victory by his death on the cross. It seems at times that his so-called victory has made no difference at all, and discouragement sets in. And we begin to wonder, is there any hope for us and for the world? We've been deceived. Satan has again separated us from the only one in whom we can have hope. And what we need to understand and remind ourselves of is that we live today in the tension between the already and the not yet. Today we live in the already. We must remember that Jesus has already defeated the principalities and the powers, but they have not yet conceded defeat. Like in, in human wars, when defeat seems imminent, the enemy will often become more desperate and do more desperate things. And so it is with these powers of evil. But we also live in the not yet. The principalities and the powers have not yet conceded defeat, but because of Jesus' victory through his death and resurrection, their ultimate defeat is certain. And while the attacks of the principalities and powers may seem to grow more intense, more pain, more suffering, more separation, more discouragement, Paul reminds us that by his death on the cross, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them. The powers of evil know that when we turn to Jesus and put our faith in him, their power over us is defeated. Jesus has disarmed and defeated those powers. That does not mean that our lives will be free from pain, suffering, and discouragement. Until Jesus' ultimate triumph is finally won, the powers will not quit trying. But by Christ's victory on the cross, we have some tools at our disposal that are not in the toolbox of the evil one. We have that whole armor of God, truth, righteousness, the peace that comes with the good news, the, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. We have forgiveness, 
We have the fruit of the Spirit within us. Love, joy, peace, patience, and more. And we have hope. And in this tension between the already and the not yet, we await the final victory when Christ returns in glory. In the meantime, the principalities and powers are working overtime because they know their end is coming. So how, how can we live in this tension between the already and the not yet? Well, first I might suggest that we can live with confidence. With confidence. Christ has already won the victory. One commentator suggests that we live with an impudent cheerfulness when confronted by the principalities and powers of this world, like the kind shown by Stephen when he was about to be stoned to death and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And we live with the kind of confidence the early Christians showed when they were put into the Roman arenas for entertainment, but defied the powers with prayer and with faith. Christ has won the victory, so we can live confidently in that knowledge. Live also, secondly, with caution. With caution. Even though Christ lives in us through his spirit, we are still flawed human beings and can still be seduced by the powers of evil. The value systems of the world, wealth, prestige, power, political clout, these are the values of the principalities and the powers and not of Christ, who humbled himself and gave himself for others. You might remember in the garden, finding his disciples sleeping, Jesus said to them, Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. So live cautiously, fully aware of the seductive powers of evil. <clears throat> and in this tension between the already and the not yet, we need to be the church Jesus intended us to be. In Ephesians 3, 10 and 11, Paul says, God's purpose in all of this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was his eternal plan, which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord. As Christ's church, we are called to confront the work of the principalities and the powers of the world. As salt and light, the church is called to confront unjust social systems to advocate for those who are oppressed by them, to be witnesses for peace and justice in the world. And we do so in ways that demonstrates Christ's example of humility and self-sacrifice, in ways that, that bring release to those who are captive and give sight to the blind and set the oppressed free. Jesus was in a constant battle with the principalities and powers throughout his ministry. So why should we think that we won't be? Every time he healed the sick, cast out a demon, raised the dead, he won another victory over the evil one. And on the cross, the mortal wound was delivered. The final tool of Satan, death, was defeated. So we no longer need fear death. Jesus crushed the head of the serpent. Not by might, but by suffering love have the principalities and powers been defeated. Satan's claim on us is broken, and he's been disarmed. We're no longer separated from God. Our sins have been forgiven. We are part of God's family. No longer need we be deceived, deluded, or discouraged. The schemes and the works of Satan need no longer have power over us because Jesus has destroyed the works of the devil. He has disarmed the rulers and authorities and made a public example of them, triumphing over them through his death on the cross. It is finished. Prepare our hearts and minds for a time of communion as we sing, Jesus, keep me near the cross.
were in love and fellowship with your brothers and sisters who truly and earnestly repent of your sins and who humbly put your trust in Christ and desire his help that you might lead a more godly life. Draw near to God and receive these emblems to your comfort and wholeness through Jesus Christ. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The deacons will distribute the bread, and please hold it until all are served, and we can share in the affirmation of faith and eat together. We hold in our hands a symbol of the body of Christ broken for us. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, might this symbol of your broken body be a blessing to us as we remember, as you told us to remember. Amen. Let us affirm our faith through the words. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take and eat. In the same way, Jesus took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The deacons will come and distribute the cups. And again, please hold your cup until all who are served.
We hold in our hands the symbol of the new life that is ours through Christ's shed blood. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we give you thanks that you went to the cross for us, that through your shed blood and your resurrection, we are in God's forever family. Amen. Let us affirm our faith through these words. The cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take and drink. Would you pray with me? God, you are never far from us. You reach out and touch us through your spirit, through symbols, and through the hands of those we love. We are deeply grateful to have a place at your table and to share in this sacred food. By your grace, may we continue on our journey with you, carrying into all of life the saving grace and the love of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. If you place your cup in the plastic bag, the deacons will come around and collect them. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Let's stand and sing together. This Holy Week was a momentous week in the life of our Savior. Spend some time in John's Gospel this week, reliving that story, and come back next week to celebrate and go in Christ's peace. Amen. Amen.